His title is, um, Did Jesus Really Rise from the Dead? Um, so I'm just going to invite Adrian up now, who's our speaker for the week. Um, he's from a church in London. If you do have any questions or anything throughout, please um, feel free to text the number that will be on the screen, and we will do that at the end. Cheers. Thanks very much, James. Well, welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, let me just introduce myself by saying that when I myself was a skeptic, it was historical evidence that persuaded me that Jesus must have risen physically from the dead. And that was a key reason why I decided to turn around and start following Christ. There are well over a billion people alive today who are convinced that Jesus of Nazareth punched a hole through death so that everybody who trusts in him will follow him through the barrier of death into heaven. Yesterday, lunchtime, we saw Jesus claiming to be God. But so what? Well, crucially, Jesus predicted that he would back up his claim to be God by rising from the dead. But the question follows, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Dr. Gary Habermas has made a detailed study of all 2,200 articles and books which credentialed scholars have published on the resurrection since 1975. Habermas is considered to have researched the academic output of scholars who are scrutinizing the resurrection more exhaustively than anybody else. He and his colleague, Dr. Michael Lycona, then selected only those facts that the vast majority of scholars, including skeptical ones, consider to be historical fact. In other words, these guys rejected material, including evidence that's actually in the New Testament, which is most heavily challenged. They chose to work with only those facts that the overwhelming majority of academics, both Christian and non-Christian, consider reliable. And so using this restrained, cautious approach, I want to see if I can make a case for the resurrection using just four minimal facts. These are facts that are accepted even by scholars who oppose the resurrection. Minimal fact number one. Jesus was crucified and died as a result. John Dominic Crossan, the co-founder of the Jesus Seminar, has spent most of his life seeking to debunk historic Christianity. But even he admits that Jesus was crucified is as sure as anything historical can ever be. James D. Tabor, another high-profile attacker of Christianity, he agrees. Tabor says, we need have no doubt. Given Jesus' execution by Roman crucifixion, Jesus was truly dead. More importantly, our ancient non-Christian sources, Tacitus, Josephus, the Jewish Babylonian Talmud, and Lucian of Samosata all say that Jesus was crucified. And all four of the Gospels report Jesus' death on the cross. Now, academic New Testament scholars, they don't treat Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as infallible scripture, or even as scripture at all. And for the purposes of this lunchtime, we won't either. We can simply accept those four Gospels for what they unquestionably are, Ancient documents, written sometime before the end of the first century, that can be subjected to historical scrutiny. And there are lots of other reasons why modern skeptics are so sure that Jesus died by crucifixion. For starters, these Roman soldiers were a professional crucifixion team. They were experts at executing people. Besides, if a prisoner escaped death the responsible soldiers might be put to death themselves. So these guys had a huge incentive to make absolutely sure that Jesus was dead before they took him down from the cross. The Gospels report that they thrust a spear up into his side to be absolutely sure that he was already dead 
before they took his body down, we now know that the separated water and blood that flowed out of the wound is actually good medical evidence that Jesus was already dead. But could Jesus possibly have survived crucifixion? Maybe Jesus survived crucifixion, and then in the cool air of the tomb, he might have recovered enough strength to roll away the stone and then overpower the guards and then appear to his disciples. In my book, Aftershock, I wrote, The idea that Jesus never died on the cross asks us to believe that a man could survive a Roman flogging, a crucifixion from the world's most professional execution force, and a spear through his heart, and then unwrap himself from yards of cloth, probably soaked in 34 kilograms of spice, push away a huge stone, fight his way past maybe up to 16 guards, then appear to his disciples as a picture of health, convincing them that one day they could have a glorious resurrection body just like his. This explanation also requires Jesus to become a liar and a hoaxer who contrived the world's most elaborate deception, Christianity. Maybe it's not that surprising that the survival theory has never really got off the ground. Minimal fact number two, Jesus' tomb was empty. Now, even, even an atheist historian will tell you that on the third day, the tomb was empty. Three days after Jesus' body was buried, it simply wasn't there. Now, why? Why are atheists willing to admit that the tomb was empty? Answer, because historians agree that if Jesus' dead body had been in the tomb, then the Jews and the Romans would have produced the body as soon as the Christians started declaring Jesus is alive. Remember, Jesus of Nazareth had been such a blasphemous threat to the Jews and such a political threat to the Romans that these two groups had conspired together to kill him. The whole point of killing him was to snuff out Jesus and his embryonic religious movement. The last thing that they wanted was Jesus' disciples going around persuading people that he'd risen from the dead. If they had had the body, then as the disciples started touring Jerusalem, punching the air, saying, Christ is risen, Jesus is alive, the Jews, or for that matter the Romans, would have walked behind the disciples with Jesus' dead body on a cart, saying, no, no, he's not risen, he's not alive. Look, come over here, you can see he's dead. Jesus was, after all, a celebrity. You see, strictly, spe strictly speaking, Christianity should not exist. It should never have got off the ground. The so-called resurrection appearances of Jesus, they should have been instantly disproved by both the Jews and the Romans who had the dead body of Jesus in a sealed tomb, which, according to the Gospels, was guarded by soldiers. But neither the Jews nor the Romans ever did produce the body. That is because they could see for themselves that the tomb was empty. So the Jews or the Romans would have produced the body if they'd had it. The reason they didn't was because Jesus had gone missing. The best thing they could do at the time to explain the empty tomb was to make up a story that the disciples had stolen his body while all the guards were asleep, which, if nothing else shows, they definitely didn't have the body. Minimal fact number three, Jesus' disciples believed that he rose and that he had appeared to them. Question, okay, what about these resurrection appearances? I mean, come on, aren't, aren't they just legends which grew up over time? I mean, after all, wasn't it, wasn't it hundreds of years later that these resurrection appearance stories eventually did get written down? Well, we know that's not the case for all of the reasons that we looked at here on Tuesday lunchtime. But suffice to say... Rather than being hundreds of years later, our earliest record of the resurrection appearances can be traced back and dated to within a few months of the resurrection. On Tuesday lunchtime, we spent a long time looking at this very early creed, which is contained in this document called 1 Corinthians 15. 
There is a wide agreement amongst scholars from all sorts of different backgrounds that this list of resurrection appearances was created before 35 AD. That Paul, the writer of this letter, picked it up in 35 AD, and that when he did pick it up, it was already well established. It wasn't like a new thing, it was a well established list, a document that he collected in 35 AD. That shows the resurrection appearances are as old as Christianity itself. It shows the resurrection appearances are not a much later legendary development. So we have got a very early report of the resurrection. Question? Yeah, okay. But what if the resurrection appearances were hallucinations? I mean, don't you think? People who hallucinate, they want to see something so badly that they think they really are seeing it. I mean, maybe the disciples imagined the resurrection. Well, psychologists study hallucinations. Let's just be clear. For this idea to work, we would have to say that all 550 or so people who saw the resurrected Jesus on 11 different occasions over a period of six weeks were all hallucinating the same thing. That everyone who had meals with him, everyone who touched him, everyone who had long conversations with him were all hallucinating. Now here is the problem. Psychologists tell us there is no such thing as a group hallucination. We don't know of any group hallucinations. Only one person can see a specific hallucination at any one time. There's no reason to think that I could somehow contrive a hallucination in you. The whole point of a hallucination is that there's nothing actually there. So if I am having a hallucination, it's all in my mind. Obviously, nobody else can see exactly what I'm seeing. So even if two people did simultaneously hallucinate the risen Jesus, for one person, Jesus might be um, eating a piece of fish. But for the other person, Jesus might be flying through the sky. Now... Let's face it, hallucinations are very rare. Hallucinations are usually caused either by bodily deprivation or by drugs. Are we really being asked to believe that these people, over many weeks, hundreds of people in various locations from all kinds of different backgrounds, all had identical, simultaneous hallucinations? Individuals who do hallucinate don't usually suddenly stop. So the large number of resurrection appearances and the fact that they came to an abrupt halt, those two things make the hallucination theory even more unlikely. Now remember, our earliest source here says that over 500 people saw the risen Jesus on one occasion. Now let's say for the sake of the argument that two people could hallucinate the same thing at the same time. 500? Remember, hallucinations can't be touched, yet the resurrected Jesus was tangible. But even so, I don't know about you, I had expected to find that despite all of this, the hallucination theory would win some supporters. But actually, hardly anyone has ever argued seriously for it because hallucinations are restricted to individuals. But there's another alternative, surely. Hang on, something much more simple. Maybe the disciples just lied. Yeah? What if Jesus' disciples did steal his body, and then they began a rumor that Jesus had risen from the dead? So we are talking now about, undoubtedly, the world's most successful deception. Let's imagine the disciples stole the body. Initially, I find this hard to believe because... These men were strict Jews. They lived to a very high moral standard. Are we going to say that they went all over the world telling people that Jesus had risen from the dead when all the time they knew it was a miserable lie? They knew in their hearts Jesus wasn't risen at all because actually they themselves had stolen the body and I don't know what they did with it. Maybe they buried it somewhere. The biggest problem with this argument is that the disciples didn't just say that Jesus was risen, they actually died for it. Question, hang on a minute. Hang on, Adrian. That's not a problem. Loads of people die for their religious beliefs. Yes. 
Yes, people die for what they believe in. People tend not to die for lies that they know are lies because they actually made up the lie themselves. Yet the disciples were martyred for their belief in the resurrection. These disciples were in the unique position of knowing without a doubt whether or not they had hoaxed the resurrection. If they had stolen the body and then they somehow hoaxed the resurrection appearances, would they have allowed themselves to be tortured to death for their lies? Because that's what happened. Peter was crucified upside down in 64 AD. The disciples Bartholomew and Philip were crucified. Andrew was crucified with ropes in a star shape. Some of them were beheaded. I mean, the list of martyrdoms goes on. You see, the disciples were literally crucified for their belief in the resurrection. Right up until the last minute, they could have escaped death just by admitting that they'd stolen Jesus' body. If the resurrection was a scam that they'd invented, don't you think at least one of them would have cracked and said, maybe even from the cross as they're being killed, look, I give up. It was a lie. Come on, look, just cut me down. It was a lie that we made up. We stole the body. Let me get on with the rest of my life. They could have escaped death simply by making that admission, but none of them did because they knew that Jesus had risen. So our third minimal fact that is accepted, even by skeptics, even by opponents of Christianity, is that the disciples weren't deliberately lying. They genuinely did believe that Jesus had risen and that he had appeared to them. Minimal fact number four, fourth and last fact. Very brief on this one. The conversion of the anti-Christian persecutor of the church, Saul of Tarsus. We have evidence that this man really was opposed to Christianity. He says he was converted because he personally saw the resurrected Jesus and then had a conversation with him. And we have six sources. Luke, Clement of Rome, Polycarp, Tertullian, Dionysius, and Origen. They all confirm this newly converted Paul, changed his name to Paul, he was willing to suffer continuously. He was even willing to die for his belief that he had met the resurrected Jesus. Okay, so we've, we've done our four facts. We've looked at four minimal facts. Now let's imagine our initial goal is we just want to undermine or at least discredit the resurrection. Okay? So we need to come up with something to get going. We need to come up with an alternative theory. Remember, any attempt to explain away these four facts can't leave any of the four facts out. If you were... In a jury, if you were a juror at the Old Bailey at a trial right now, if the judge has sent you into a room about this size to deliberate and come up with a verdict, right now, with your 11 colleagues, you'd be looking for a verdict that best fits the known facts. You'd be looking right now with the other jurors for a verdict that fits the facts that aren't in dispute. Folks, the reason why I became convinced that Jesus must have risen from the dead, is because it turns out that the resurrection explanation outdistances all the other competing hypotheses by such a large margin. The resurrection is the only explanatory theory that can accommodate all the known facts. For example, let's imagine we say the resurrection never happened. Hey, fair enough. I used to think that. I was a skeptic. The resurrection never happened. Fair enough. We've still got to come up with something to account for the explosive growth of Christianity. We saw on Tuesday that the Roman historian Tacitus tells us there were an immense multitude of Christians in Rome in 64 AD. These people, Tacitus tells us, are ready to die for Jesus. Why would an immense number of people in Rome risk being killed by the Emperor Nero to worship as God a man who'd suffered the ultimate humiliation in Roman society of being crucified? These people are choosing to worship what in their culture was the scum of the earth. That's what a crucified man was. So let's say to explain this historical fact, I choose the hallucination theory. Fair enough. Even if the hallucination theory is true, it doesn't fit all four facts. 
Even if I did reject everything psychologists tell us about hallucinations, if I say Christianity is based on mass hallucination, I still have to explain the empty tomb. I still have to explain why the authorities didn't produce the real body of Jesus. Sir Norman Anderson of Trinity College, Cambridge, a world-famous expert on Islamic law, said, quote, The empty tomb, then, forms a veritable rock upon which all rationalistic theories, which attempt to disprove the resurrection, dash themselves in vain. But at the end of the day, and at the end of this talk, somebody might understand if you say, look, <coughs> I've come in, I've eaten the sandwiches and crisps and whatnot, I've listened to what you've had to say, uh, I just want you to know, it's not for me. I mean, Jesus may be risen for you, but he's not risen for me. Okay? Well, in response, I'm sure that we could all agree that if we had been doubting Thomas, <clears throat> as he reaches out towards the supposedly resurrected Jesus, at some point he would either have touched real flesh or he wouldn't. I'm sure we could all agree that if you and I had gone into the tomb of Jesus on that first ever Easter Sunday, as we both walked in, it's a fairly small space, we would either both have seen, yeah, look, there's a human body right there. There's you and me, and then there's somebody's dead body right here. Or we would both have gone into the tomb and looked around and thought, oh, there's just you and me here. It's empty. Can you honestly say that as you and I left the tomb of Jesus, that one of us would have turned to the other and said, well, it may have been empty for you, but it wasn't empty for me. No. We are talking about a physical, tangible body here. History is terribly brutal to relativism. The resurrection isn't just true for Christians. It's either true for everyone because it really happened, or it isn't true for anyone because it didn't happen. Which brings us lastly to the effect of the resurrection right now. A little bit of personal story here. When I was a student in the late 1980s, I lived in a college, and, and this college, um, sadly for us, the food wasn't great, and that didn't matter because we knew Alan Blackwood. And Alan Blackwood had a car. And in the late 1990s, 1980s a gra an undergraduate with a car was an amazing thing. So you just naturally wanted to be friends with Alan Blackwood because Alan Blackwood could take you to my kind of pizza. And so each evening we would climb into Alan's car, all five of us fitting in there, and we'd go down to my kind of pizza. We'd then sit in Alan's car and we'd eat pizza. But because we were A, students, and B, blokes, it never occurred to us to take the empty pizza boxes out of Alan's car. And so about, by about week seven of term, Alan's car was full of used, empty, greasy pizza boxes. Until it came to that night, unforgettable night, when we went down to get our pizza, we went to Alan's car, we opened the door, and we could not get in to Alan's car. Now, one of my friends said, many years later, one of the five of us, He's now 34 years old. He became a Christian at the age of 34. And he said, I did to God what we did to Alan's car. And I remember saying, what? What do you mean? He said, look, I crowded God out. I so filled my life with stuff that there was no room for God to get in. And of course, there came a night when we did have to get these things black bin bags, and we had to empty Alan's car of all the pizza boxes. So, just for the sake of the illustration, let's imagine this bin bag represents the rubbish in our lives. This is the effect of the resurrection right now. And here we are, we're not, well, we're not good enough for a good God. We're not perfect enough for a perfect God. This is the problem that we have, because of the rubbish in our lives, the things that we've done wrong, the times when we've pushed God to the margins. That's the problem. But let's imagine that Jesus is like this white sheet. Let's imagine that he hasn't done anything wrong, that he's lived a perfect life. And in Christianity, what happens is that Christ covers over all 
of the sins of those who trust in him. So that once we are in Christ, once we trust Christ, we are acceptable to God because of who he is. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. If anyone lives and believes in me, he'll live even if he dies. The Bible says that God made him who knew no sin, that's Jesus the white sheep, to be sin, so that in him we could become the righteousness of God. So we're perfect because Christ is perfect. And that's the amazing thing. So therefore, if we're in Christ, then we can go through the barrier of death. If Christ is raised from the dead, if he goes through the barrier of death into heaven, well then we're in him, so we go, not because we're good enough, we're not good enough, but because Christ is good enough. So if he's raised, we're raised. And this is the amazing impact of the, re of the, of the resurrection. It means if Christ is risen, then death isn't the end. It means if Christ is risen, then there is hope after death. If Christ is risen, that is great news for you, and it's great news for me. And if you want to say yes to the risen Christ, if you want to be in Christ, then you can respond to him just maybe through a simple prayer, like a prayer like this, something like this. I'll just read a prayer here. Father God, I'm sorry for the wrong things I've done, for the times I've put myself first. I've sinned and fallen short of your glory. But thank you so much for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross in my place as my substitute instead of me. I'm turning to you. You are my saviour and Lord. And so I just wanted to finish, this will only take me 20 seconds, just by reading this prayer again. Because each day we've found there are people who've wanted to pray a prayer like this. And so if that's you, I'd just like to give you the opportunity. So I'm just going to read this prayer again. You don't have to say anything. You can just close your eyes or look at the screen, whatever works for you. But for those who do want to say, yeah, I want to be in Christ. I want to benefit from his resurrection. Then if that's you, why don't you pray with me if you'd like to. Let's pray. And maybe you're praying something like this, just silently in your heart. Father God, I'm sorry for the wrong things that I've done. For the times I put myself first. I have sinned and fallen short of your glory. But thank you so much for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross in my place as my substitute instead of me. I am turning to you. You are my saviour and Lord. Amen. Great. Cheers, guys. Thanks so much. We really appreciate your comments and stuff. Um, I've got a few te um, questions texting, but please feel free to text any more in during this time now. Um, so the first question was, why did someone have to die? Why couldn't God just forgive sins without Jesus dying? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I suppose it's a little bit like asking um, why would a high court judge have to deal with someone who's uh, committed a murder. The idea in Christianity is that God really is a judge. I mean, he's actually the ultimate judge. It's, it's more important that he gets it right than any of the lower courts because he's like the final court of appeal. This is the supreme court. So in the Christian worldview, God really is a judge Therefore, if real sins against him are happening, if there really is wrongdoing in the world, then any just judge has to punish sin. Now, this is actually quite important to us, because you and I know that some crimes either get unreported, or the culprit gets away with it. There are miscarriages of justice, aren't there? But if the God of Christianity is real, then everything gets seen, and that judge will deal rightly with every sin. So if the punishment, if the just punishment for sin turns out to be death, then either the sinner has to die, or maybe the judge might accept a substitute. The unique thing in Christianity, the unique idea in Christianity, is the idea of God himself allowing his own son to die instead of us. This is something that a typical judge wouldn't allow. A typical judge wouldn't look at somebody in the dock thinking they deserve the death penalty and then allow their son to come in as a volunteer and judge their son and send him to death instead. You know, the judge typically doesn't love the prisoner that much. But in Christianity, that's exactly what happens, that God punishes his son. Bizarre idea, I know. But it's a unique thing about Christianity. God allows his son to die instead of those who trust in him. 
So if we do trust in Christ, a bit like I was saying with the visual aid, because Christ is good enough, if we are in Christ, that because he's acceptable, we can be acceptable to God. I know that's an unusual idea. As you can imagine, it's a very powerful idea. And uh, anyway, that's the heart of the Christian faith. Great. Good, Has good anyone question. got anything they want to respond to that at all? Cool. Um, another one was, um, why is there such a fear of death? Why is there such a fear of death? Uh, well, gosh, I mean, anyone here could probably give an equally good answer, I think, on this one. Um, what do you think? Uh, there's a fear of death because um, if death is it, if when you're dead, you're dead, well, then the, uh, everything, all the meaning and everything in life is all in this life. So we're afraid of dying in that worldview because we think, oh, gosh, that's it. You know, I need to make the most, I've got to maximize my happiness, my enjoyment, whatever it is I'm looking to get out of life. It needs to happen now because I could die tomorrow, the next day, who knows, next week. Um, so people are afraid of death on that basis, I would imagine. Um, yeah, I mean, that, I, I don't really think I have an authoritative opinion on, on that at all. I imagine people are just scared that, you know, that's it. Yeah. Cool. Um, uh, another one was, why are we going to be judged when, die, um, when we die for our sins? Why are we going to be judged? Well... If there were somebody who's here today who had never done anything wrong, then of course you would have absolutely nothing to worry about. Because you'd stand before a holy God who's seen everything you've ever thought, said and done, and there'd be no problems at all. So if that's you, then there isn't an issue. However, for me personally, I'm not in that boat. Um, I don't have to think very far before I can immediately think of lots of things when I knew what the right thing to do was and I did the wrong thing. When I did push God to the margins of my life, you know, I did stuff my car, the car of my life with other things and push God out. I put myself first. My selfishness, my sins are things that God has seen. And if heaven is perfect and pure and I'm not, then there is a problem. That's the problem that the cross addresses that problem. So Christianity is answering, offering an answer to that dilemma, the fact of a holy God and unholy me. And Christianity solves that problem through Christ coming and dying on the cross. That's why Christians are always focusing on the cross, because that's the crucial moment when God solves the problem of sin. Cool. Um, there's a couple of questions that were a little bit similar. So um, was there any other alternative hypotheses? And then another one was... Um, to to the that, resurrection? Yes. So, and then another yes. one was um, the fact that the tomb is empty. Could grave robbers have stolen the body? Yeah, okay, good, good, very good question. Um, so let's just have a think about the second one. Um, in terms of the empty tomb, there are, th there are three... This is about grave robbers um, stealing uh, the body. There are three aspects, if you like, of the empty tomb story that make me confident that the tomb was, was empty and that Christ rose from the dead. So firstly, that, that would be the Jerusalem factor, the fact that it was in Jerusalem that this new religious movement took off, the very place where people could have gone to the rich man's tomb. He was buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. So this wasn't an obscure tomb. Um, it was a, a well-known one. There were also the guards. That's going to be a challenge. The idea that these guards are posted there specifically to stop people stealing the body. You'd also have to wonder what would be the motivation of grave robbers stealing this human body. That's a question that I'd have. Then you've got the fact that there's enemy attestation um, of the fact that you've got a, uh, a, there's a Jew called Trifo who's arguing with a Christian apologist called Justin Martyr more than 100 years later, circulating the story that the disciples stole the body. If, the, if grave robbers have stolen the body, it's surprising that that story has never come through history. It's surprising that that idea has never emerged from the historical record. Thirdly, you've got the testimony of the women. Now, this is a uh, slightly shocking fact, I'm afraid to us, in the 21st century. But back in the 1st century, I'm afraid that the testimony of women wasn't 
admissible in a court of law. Women couldn't inherit property, they couldn't bring any testimony in a legal case. And yet, in the New Testament, the first witnesses of both the empty tomb and also the resurrection appearances are women. So if you were trying to contrive a story, now if actually grave robbers nick the body and the resurrection appearances are artificial, if they're a deliberate deception, because Jesus didn't rise, because grave robbers stole the body, why on earth would you choose women as your star witnesses? The very people whose testimony would undermine your cause. People would say, oh, this new Christianity thing, it's obviously not to be taken seriously, because if you heard, they're star witnesses, the first people to see A, the empty tomb, and B, the risen Jesus are women. Now, that wouldn't bother us, because we think, well, a woman's just as likely to tell the truth as a man. But in the first century, people would have literally walked away and, and thought it was a joke. So there are some key things in the evidence that would make me, anyway, think, hang on a minute, probably the reason why that detail's been left in is because, actually, the fact is that women were the first witnesses of both the empty tomb and of the resurrection. Another reason why I think this grave robber idea doesn't work is the simple fact that Tacitus tells us it was in Judea that this religion took off, this new Christianity thing. Now, in Judea, you've got strict monotheistic Jews. These are people who just believe there's one God. The idea of God having a son is, like, incomprehensible to them. How could God possibly have a son? The, the, the Lord our God is one. That's their whole worldview. And yet, we get thousands of them suddenly worshipping Jesus as God. Now, it might not appall you, it might not offend you, it might not disgust you to find that you have a Christian friend who worships a man as God, in this case the man being Jesus. But if you had grown up in Jerusalem in the first century, you would have been sickened by the idea of that kind of idolatry, of worshipping a carpenter as God. You would have thought that was ridiculous and appalling. So you have to ask the question, what would it take you to do something tomorrow that today you think is disgusting and appalling and despicable? Well, that is what worshipping a man was to a first century Jew, but we know that thousands of them suddenly did it. Not because the Bible tells us, although the Bible does tell us that's what happened, but also even Tacitus, who wasn't a Christian, tells us that's what happened. So all of these reasons make me think that the grave robbing story is not sufficient to explain all of that. Great. Well, we...